So today is August 16th, 2022. I'm Mark Heinlein with the National Tile Contractors Association, and I am very happy to welcome all of you to this NTCA Roundtable Live. This is an artisan edition, and we have some special guests today that will take us through a conversation, a journey on the history of handmade tile. And I want to introduce to you our artisan team. Uh, first of all, I want to start with my colleague, Leslie Godden. Leslie, can you raise your hand and say- Hi hello? there. Welcome everybody. Glad you're here. Let's go to, our, <laughs> let's go to the rest of our artisan team, uh, starting with Jane Callowart. Hi everyone. We're so excited that you guys are all here. This is gonna be a great program. We can't thank uh, Katya and Sheila enough for uh, presenting this really important information, I think for all of us involved in the tile industry. Thanks for coming. Lee Callowart. Hey everyone, looking forward to this. I uh, hope uh, you find us, I, I'm looking forward to the history myself. Um, I'm sure you'll find it very educational. Angie Ray. Hey everybody, I'm Angie with Unique Mosaics. Nice to see you all here and um, looking forward to this round table. Joshua Nordstrom. Hey everybody, I'm Joshua. Um, glad to be here just like everybody else. And I'm really excited for this one. This is gonna be a great artist and round table. It sure is. And I want to let all of you know what our format is this evening. Uh, we are going to have a couple of presentations from our guests that will be introduced to you very soon. Um, We'll get, I'll, I'll tell you what their names are. You've heard them already. We have Sheila Menzies of the Tile Heritage Foundation, and we have Katja McWork of the Tile Works of Bucks County, Buck County, excuse me. We will get to know them much better in this evening. But first of all, let me tell you what the agenda will be. We're going to have our program, a couple of presentations, and you will be able to talk to both of our guests, but please hold your questions until the end of their presentations. If something comes to mind during the presentation, go ahead and enter it in the chat room or the chat screen. We're monitoring the chat screen and we can uh, take your questions there and work with you that way. Or after the presentation, go ahead and raise your hand and uh, join in the conversation that way. After we have some questions and answers, we're going to play the world famous Ask the Ref game, the NTCA Ask the Ref game. And tonight we'll have eight uh, questions for you. So you're gonna have eight chances to win a prize for the question. We'll explain more on those prizes and the questions later. Uh, so get ready for that, stick around. It's a lot of fun and great prizes that you can win tonight. So without further delay, I want to go over to Angie Ray and ask Angie to introduce our first guest. All right, we would like to welcome Sheila Menzies to our roundtable tonight. Uh, she's the executive director as well as the treasurer of the board of the Tile Heritage Foundation. Uh, we're all very excited to learn more about the Tile Heritage Foundation and what they are doing for research and preservation of ceramic services. Um, Sheila, you have the floor. Well, thank you. And thank you everyone for being here and joining in. I'm going to initially speak from, um, from some notes um, because it's there's a lot of detail and it's easier to get it more correct if I use notes. Um, so here we go. Tile history goes back in recorded history for probably at least 5,000 years, probably more. But we do, we do know that um, it's started off in the Middle East with a lot of um, very beautiful tiles that were very aesthetic and made for many palaces, many, many buildings in the ancient world. And they were adorned with small, brightly colored tiles. A lot of them were blue and white. And we can go back to 
Egypt to King Zuzar's um, grave in 2630, I think around that time BC, when the Steppe Pyramid was um, built in Saqqara. And then later on, we were in, in Babylon, there were tiles in Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And um, throughout the millennium, we see many, many decorative tiles that were made in that, in that era and in that time. Sea routes were developed and tiles started to move. A lot of tiles were actually used as ballast um, in boats that moved to bring other goods to other parts of the different continents. And so when, is, when the is, Islamic um, and the Middle Eastern tiles became really, really popular around the seventh century, there were many tiles that started to be seen coming into Europe from the Middle East. And part of that was through North Africa to Spain. And of course, we have all the wonderful tiles that we know of um, that exist there. Today, the Alhambra being an example of beautiful tiles that were made in Spain, a lot of them to replicate the look of the earlier tiles, which were more mosaic in that they were broken up or specially cut tiles and set as individual pieces. And so we end up with styles of tiles that, um, that we still know today, both in Cuenca and in Curtiseca, the dry line tiles. So we have these artisans and artistic tiles being made in really early, early periods. And then as we go forward, we find that there were a lot of tiles that were made that were more utilitarian, but still incredibly beautiful because of how they were installed and where they were installed. And we, as we continue looking at, at different eras, we find around AD 618 to around 906, during the China's Tang Dynasty, they got involved in blue and white porcelain and the 11th century Spanish tile makers wanted to imitate that porcelain look. And so they had a red bodied clay and they thought, well, we'll put a white tin glaze on that and make something that looks like um, porcelain. And that became very popular. Um, the Dutch followed suit and because they were traveling and traveling, you know, by sea and moving goods around, you know, both exotic goods like spices and fabrics and things like that. And tiles became one, of, again, I'm speaking about the ballast and boats were often tiles and so they moved around the world. So we have the, we have Delft, which is the blue, and then the English produced one that was very similar. And during the 12th century, we move to that, we have the monasteries all over Europe, the Christian monasteries started to have tiles made for their churches, for the monasteries themselves, for the floors, and a lot of that was made on site by itinerant tile makers, and these were inlaid tiles, often with designs, and that type of tile we know of today, or we call it an encaustic tile, but that came a little bit later. Um, so by the middle of the 17th century, tile making in Europe had become fully fledged commercial, a fully fledged commercial enterprise, and one was spurred by the growing population and international trade. So that takes us you know, forward into the um, early, early 19th century when much of Europe started to become industrialized. It was really the Industrial Revolution. And um, in Western Europe, 
in Great Britain, Herbert Minton, who was in 1793, was born into an English family of highly regarded ceramists. And he patented a method for inlaid tiles. And in 1840, produced buttons from clay dust. He saw those tiles and dubbed them in prospect. He, as he produced them, he knew that this was very similar to the inlaid tiles that had been made in earlier times in the medieval period. And so this became something that was, you know, factory produced and um, became a tradition that was one of the first types of tiles that were found in the US. When the Europeans first came to, the, to North America, no evidence of tile making existed. And so when people wanted tiles in their home, the tiles came from the UK or they came from the continent. And it was the custom across the Atlantic where fireplaces were the focal point of rooms. And we found that too in the early tiles that are in the US and in homes were tiles on fireplaces, tiles in the living spaces. So as the United States emerged from its reconstruction period after the Civil War, we find that there is a need to produce material here. And there was a centennial exposition in 1876 held in Philadelphia that signaled a major turning point in American tile production. And many, many of the artisans, the modelers, the designers were European. They came to the US and so they started making tiles here. So the European technology and personnel were in the East Coast, in Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana. And we think of Ohio and these, some of these areas, especially Ohio, as being a cradle of clay, an area where a lot of tile making, early tile making in the US started to happen. The first decorative tiles in the United States were actually art tiles. They were beautiful. They were highly glazed. They were classical in motif. And um, we find them through the 19th century. So this was in, did I, I don't know if I mentioned that was 1876. So that was kind of like the, the birthing, but there was a little bit of tile that was being made prior to that. And this was in Chelsea, Massachusetts. And that would have been the Chelsea Ceramic Artworks um, that was in that area. And so that was around 1860, so they had earlier tiles. Um, and one of the apprentices for Chelsea Works was John Gardner Lowe. And some of the tiles that he produced and his were absolutely beautiful art tiles there revered today and collected today. And then we go forward, we have many, many people, I mean, there's too many um, pieces of information here to really share in a short period of time. But this um, document I can make available to you um, in, its, in its wholeness, it's about 16 pages, I think. Um, but we go forward and around 1887, Herman Mueller was a maker of encaustic, American encaustic products. And in line with art tiles at their highest quality, in a short time, he had created a new method of producing encaustic looking tiles. And um, that became a very popular machine made product. Uh, Sheila, uh, this is Mark. Uh, can I ask you, I want to make sure that I'm not missing any of your slides. This, no, this... we're not talking about slides yet. We're, okay. I'm not on this. I'm just trying to put together here a brief history of, you know, how tile making started in the US. And gotcha. then, then I will, because most of the slides speak about what the foundation is doing and why the foundation came into being. Um, Thank you. 
And so, yes, thank you for asking that. Anyway, um, at the turn of the century, American appreciation for individual craftsmanship had developed significantly. But there was a change in the air. People started to think about having tiles that were more crafted in the sense of more handcrafted. And, and the instrument for bringing about these changes was Henry Chapman Mercer in 1856, who redirected, well, he was born in 1856 and lived to 1930. And you'll hear much more about him from Katja. But he was really focused on how tiles looked. Mercer's influence stretched from coast to coast, and he was he started making tiles in Doylestown in a style that was very similar to what had already happened in England as a, a reaction to the over-machined look of tiles. And the arts and crafts movement got a real handle um, in the US, starting with starting with Mercer and his, uh, his um, perspective about showing the clay, showing the, the really the, the, the beauty of the tile being a handcrafted object. And it became something that became a, a national trend here and it came all the way to the West Coast. And so many makers in, there were many makers on the East Coast, like William Gruby, who was involved in making artistic, handmade looking tiles. And that's the other thing that a lot of the tiles were molded and designed by hand and molded and pressed, but then they, they became sort of semi-machine made handmade tiles. In other words, they were handmade looking tiles. And we get that look also all the way through with Batchelder and Crayclaff and all the other companies that were out here during the 1920s. So it's um, sort of difficult to um, try to pull all this information into a synopsis. But what we do, do know is that Tiles have been here in the U.S. since the since the 19th century, and they are a, a phenom. We had different eras, um, even into the 20th century, after where colorful tiles that even were made in, even though they were made in, you know, in production and factories, were highly glazed, highly colored, highly designed, and highly desired. And so we find that there was this, you know, real blossom of tile use. And in California, when we were looking at how to, how to write about what had happened here, and where all of this material came from, and why, it became very important to think about documenting it. And so the first idea of documenting the tile history in the US was on California tiles. And what was a book, going to be a book, became an organization. And that organization is the Tile Heritage Foundation. So if we would like to move forward and take a look at where the foundation is located, and then I will speak about the work of the foundation to protect and preserve this amazing history that is in the US. There's a uniqueness to a lot of the handcrafted and arts and crafts and crafted colorful tiles that have been produced here both in earlier times and currently. This is the front of our home, which is also the tile heritage foundation's location. We have a few offices inside our home and the foundation also has a library. I think we can move slides, Mark. 
And this is the back. We are on the Russian River, and you can see the river here. That is our backyard or our front yard. We tend to think of it as our front yard, and the, you know the, the road. The road is the backyard. So that's where we're located. And then you'll come to the Tile Heritage Library. And this is the little separate building that's separate from our home that houses the library and archives of the foundation. We outgrew the space and to make it safer too, we have a lot of um, things in storage. Storage meaning that they're, it's organized, an organized archive. And you'll see that in a minute as well. So this is our this is our fun wall. We do have a tile wall, but we don't have a museum. We are an archive and a working library and working archive. So we can change slide here. And this is where there are where there were no books when we started out this project in 1987. There were so few books on tiles that you had to really hunt for them. And today there are literally hundreds of books on tile, tile making, tile history, both here and around the world. So we can have that next slide. And these are the office kitties. This is Mina and Giddle, and they're learning to archive. They do a very, very good job of tearing paper. <laughs> and here are the collections of the Tile Heritage Foundation. This is two of our lockers. The one of them with the orange table there is where our tile collection is maintained. And the other locker is for ephemeral materials, which is catalogs and uh, periodicals and you know lots and lots of historic material that is stored there. So we can go to the next slide. And um, what I'm going to be speaking from and most of our slides are from is from the Tile Heritage Guardian of American Tile History, which is a centerpiece in the TCNA handbook that it's called the Tile Initiative 2022. And I think this is probably the fourth version that we've had over the years by invitation of Tile Council. And um, it allows for people to see what the foundation does and, and, how, and how it operates. If I can have the next slide. And I'm just going to read you from the bottom here. It's, it starts out, you know, where um, we use this, this quote from Carl Zimmerman, who was a professor of art at the University of Cincinnati. And he said, where we have built a storehouse and filled it with books and letters, written and printed, private and public, a storehouse ever full, holding in trust all the dreams, sheltering hopes and wisdom, recording trials, failures and accomplishments. And in this manner, the Tile Heritage Foundation was developed as an archive for the tile industry in the United States. In addition to books and letters in its library, Tile Heritage storehouses a collection of historic American tiles, one of a kind, from scores of different companies dating back to the 19th century, as well as tiles from contemporary artisans. Add to this the collections of historic documents, tile catalogs, and tile-related periodicals, and it covers a period of 135 years. Rest assured, this archive and collection belongs to all of us. We can have a next slide. And here are two of our archivists working um, in the archive. Most of the um, cabinets that you actually see in this slide have been moved to um, larger and safer quarters off the mountain. This is our historic material, and this is a, an important, you know, a really important piece of the archive. And these people in the picture are Jim Hamilton and Jenny Meeker. They classify the material of each company 
on their file folders, they arrange them chronologically, and they're put into our finding aid index. The foundation is developing an index of all the materials that it holds. And we have been doing this and it's been underway for probably about nine years um, in, in the manner that we're, that we're working in. If we can have the next slide. So here, here we have some tiles that are in the collection. And these are tiles that were, again, as we spoke about earlier, where manufacturing got underway in where during the Centennial Exposition in 1876. And the tiles that we're looking at here are from the American Encaustic Tile and Company in Zanesville are some of these uh, six by six tiles. And we have some further down from Providential and also from Mosaic Tile Company. And we see down in the corner there, this special look that um, Herman Mueller designed and patented for making a mosaic looking tile. And it is really, it's a, it is a fascinating tile. We can change pages. These are really wonderful tiles that are very beautifully made in the Tile Heritage Collection. They are large format tiles for that period of time. They're 19, 1920s, 1930s. Um, these were the top ones are claycraft potteries, and these are designs from scenes in California. And they're absolutely gorgeous tiles. They're quite big. They're eight by twelves, twelve by twelves. And then on the lower part, we have batch elder tiles. And some of those are um, 18 by 18 for the ships and 12 by 36 for some of these wonderful knights on, horse, knights on horseback and um, fanciful things that really were part of that arts and crafts genre. Then we can move forward and see some more product that we have in the collection. These are all one of a kind items. So these are murest tiles and they were made in a similar manner again in that arts and crafts tradition. And um, this is by a company, um, the murest tile company was in Oakland, California. And at your leisure, you can actually look at this whole layout um, because it is in the centerfold of the TCNE handbook. Let's move to the next page and see what we have in, else in the collection. The other thing that we collect are historic manufacturers sample boards and sample boxes. These are just fantastic. It's amazing that we've been able to collect those items and the generous people who have worked in the industry have provided them. And um, the Tile Heritage Foundation does not purchase the, with, the exception of, with the exception of books. We do purchase books for the for the library, but as far as the collections go, everything has been donated by generous um, sponsors or members or friends of the foundation. We can move to the next page, and these are product catalogs. The other thing that we collect um, in this valuable archive is marketing sales and distribution materials from the industry. And we have historic material from the late 19th century up through, you know, there's pre-depression material and there's contemporary material um, from companies that are you know, producing tiles today and producing catalogs for the material. So we can move forward. Another wonderful aspect of the collection is the vintage architectural renderings for the inclusion of tiles in um, these would have been produced by probably um, people who were planning to be the installers of the tiles. Often tiles were sold by the installers. Um, 
they they were the ones with the small showrooms and they were the ones who did the takeoffs and who did the design work for installations. There's a lot of um, restoration work that we need to do with this material. So it's one of the things that we like to fund along with books. So we can move forward to our, we have a very special book collection that contains lots of valuable vintage books. And whenever we have grant funds, um, which we are you know, very generously provided, we try to take a percentage of that funding and restore books that are very valuable. Um, they're valuable history for the industry and they're very valuable um, for the collection, you know, into the future. So we can turn page. And these are just more of the valuable materials that are in, in our collections. And again, this information that you're looking at in the slides is actually a document and it's, you know, you can have it as a, it's actually a, a download. You can download it or you can um, look at it in, in um, print form in the handbook. So let's have a, let's go forward to the periodicals. And um, in that collection, we have a lot of um, older catalogs, but also things that are, that have a lot of information about the early industry. For instance, um, there is the magazine Palette and Bench is a very arts and crafts type period piece. And we have a few of those in our collection. We also have the Ceramic Studio. We have quite a large collection of these older pieces and Clay Worker. And um, I think we may have a full set of the um, architect and engineer. They're just really marvelous early um, providers of information and you know just sort of historic interest to their, their have a lot of um, architectural features and advertising as well. So you get to see what, what was happening in early advertising. We can turn page here, next one. And here we have 20th century and 21st century periodicals today that some of which um, we actually collect most of it. Um, I think most of the material here, obviously some of it is something that we might have subscribed to, but I think most of it we we sign up for and organizations send us their material. And there obviously are some earlier stuff here from, you know, American Ceramic Society, Gladding McBean, and Associated Tile Manufacturers. That was a very important um, organization because it was one of the first ways that companies could work together as a group to sell and market their tiles. And so we can turn page here and we have other things in the collection. There are over, I think there's, well, I think it doesn't say there, yes, 134 tile, titles um, and some of them rare. And these go back, Tile Industry News from 1965. Um, and through, I think we have I think it goes through, through 98 from the Ceramic Tile Institute. And then Tiles and Tile Work is a really amazing magazine with done by the Rossman Corporation. And again, these were tools for marketing tools for the industry. And in the same way that we have you know, different ways of doing, doing this today, whether it's going online to buy a tile or other places. So that takes us to the next page. And here we have Tile Heritage Publications. The organization started in 1987, um, and this is our 35th year. And we do have a publication, Tile Heritage Review. And it's um, 
has a lot of historic material that is published. The writers are, in general, they are um, guest writers who are historians or have a great affection for tiles and, and are collectors who write and speak about it. And then we also have a collection of our own material in, initially it was in Flashpoint, which was a published um, quarterly. And now that it has been replaced with our e-news online. So we can move forward one more page. And all of our work is accomplished by and sustained by our sponsors, our members, and our advocates. It is absolutely essential. And this work has been able to be sustained for 35 years because we have had that support. And that support is really from the industry. And we encourage it and we want to see more and more of that support happening. And each of us has a ability to be part of that and participate in providing support for the foundation by advocating for it. This is, this is our organization as, a, as an industry. And I just want to say here, collectively the US tile industry is a cultural influencer. We want people to create and work in the industry to more fully recognize that fact. We want tile heritage guardianship of American tile history to resonate more broadly for the industry. We want the rich richness of the art history of ceramic surfaces in America to be more fully embraced in a bigger part of the national dialogue. Thank you for being an advocate of that. Thank you. I'm on mute. Something's on mute. Sheila, can I ask a question? There's uh, one of the questions that came up in the chat, which was, are there digital copies of books and other collateral stored on the cloud, uh, like preservation in case of fire and flood or uh, or even if it's available to people who are interested? The, um, the materials the materials themselves are, are not digitized. We have, um, what we're building is um, an, an index of the materials that we hold. You know, ultimately it would be very good to be able to um, scan and digitize the material. There's over 140,000 documents and there's an equal number of images. The images are digitized. We do have a digital um, library of, of um, photography, but the, um, the materials that are held, the historic material that is held in our files that, you know, are really the industry's history are not, not in digital files um, as yet. I mean, that's down the road, that would be a very nice thing to be able to fund and do. But the index, you know, knowing what we have there and that the historic material has been finished and uh, with our, through our archivists. And so that uh, index, it hasn't been published online yet, but it will eventually be online as well so that people know what we have and, and can, you know, call it up. Uh, Sheila, that was unbelievably excellent information. Uh, thank you. If anyone else has any uh, uh, questions or anything for Sheila, please uh, jot it down in the chat screen or remember it, and we can come back to that and ask Sheila those things um, after our next presenter. But let me turn it Mark, over now to Joshua. Mark, Mark, can I interrupt real quick? Mark, Hello, Jim. Can I interrupt real quick? I'd just like to ask Sheila, is it you need more financing to digitalize those copies that you don't have at this time? Is that what we're waiting for? Um, we, we haven't taken that step yet. Um, we're, we're 
the step that we're working on is finalizing the digital index. And then there has been discussion about actually scanning all of the material, but it is, it's not something that's on, on the forefront of the agenda at the moment. The, the big thing is to get the index actually online. And, um, you know, there's, we know that there are, there are organizations out there that will scan for us, but we, we have not engaged in that so far, and we have not tried to fund it so far. But it's okay. When you're ready to fund it, Sheila, let me know. I'd love to help you try and raise that money. Okay. Thank you, Jim. That would be just awesome. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Sheila. We can come back to you later. Joshua, turning it over to you, sir. All right. Uh, I think I got my mic on. Uh, I am going to introduce Katja McGurk. She uh, runs the tile works of Buck County in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. It is a national historic landmark that has assumed operations of the Moravian Marab <coughs> Pottery and Tile Works, uh, founded by Henry Chapman Mercer in 1898. Um, if anybody pays attention to uh, the Tile Letter Artisan Magazine that uh, Leslie has so graciously put together here the past couple of years, she did a nice article in the fall uh, 2021 issue uh, featuring the, uh, the grounds there. It's a beautiful old uh, building. Um, you might recognize that uh, from, from that article. Uh, and uh, this year they held their 22nd annual Marabran, I can't say that word, right? Moravian Pottery and Tile Festival. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Katja and uh, let her fully explain uh, what she does there. Thank you, Joshua. Um, thanks for having me here. And I'm excited to talk about Henry Mercer. Um, why tile? Why is it relevant? Why, what is the relevance of this tradition and how does it bridge art and industry? This is not such a deep dive into Henry Chapman Mercer and his Moravian Pottery and Tile Works, founded in 1898, located in Bucks County. In the current pottery today, it was built in 1910 to 1912. Next. Next, yes. Henry Mercer founded the Moravian Pottery and Tile Works as a midlife crisis project. He was a Renaissance man, scholarly, innovative, experimental. He celebrated the ordinary man and collected and told stories through clay. Next. Henry is seen here with a sculpture of his beloved dog, Rollo. In his lifetime, he received widespread recognition for his tile work, including the grand prize for his display at the St. Louis World Fair of 1904. And as a master member of the Society of Arts and Crafts, he was awarded the bronze medal, the first potter to receive the award. The society was instrumental in promoting and selling his work. And through them, he got many commissions. Next. This is the model of Font Hill. Henry Mercer experimented with reinforced concrete embracing its properties. Font Hill was built to showcase his tile collections and his print collection. It was home to Henry, his pottery manager, Frank Swain, and Frank's wife, Laura, who inhabited it till her death in 1975. Next. Font Hill Castle has 44 rooms, 200 windows, 18 fireplaces, 10 bathrooms, and one powder room. Next, Mercer, caref Mercer carefully embellished it with colorful ornamental tile that he said should be used sparingly. This is the entry hall. <laughs> Next, the bathroom is above the morning room. In the tiles there, you can see top of the morning written in his own humor and quirkiness, sort of a pun and play on words. Next. Next. This is the ceiling of the library at Font Hill. Custom capitals and ceiling groins are embellished with brocade style tiles inspired by a Spanish trunk 
in his study. How may you ask, did he do this? And I'll give you a clue. It's called the sandbox method. We can talk about that in another talk. Next. This is the bow room ceiling, depicting a map of Mexico City. Next. This is a mosaic of the departure of Columbus in the Columbus room on the floor. Mercer had a veneration for the past, a love of languages like Latin, interested in technical history of industry and his extensive European travel informed his work. Mercer was appointed curator at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania in the early 1890s. He left the museum in the late 1890s frustrated, disgruntled, and ready to embark on his midlife project, the tile factory. The second building next, this is the Mercer Museum. It is the house to Mercer's collection of tools of the nation maker. There are tools and imp implements that illustrate the development of domestic industries and founding of the civilized home. Mercer's study of tools of the recently concluded past and working backwards in time was dubbed archaeology turned upside down, reversed, revolutionized. This practice is being revitalized today at the University of Pennsylvania. Next. A springtime shot of the Moravian Pottery and Tile Works built from 1910 to 1912. The idea of restoring an old pottery was superseded by that of building a new one. It was a practical idea, Mercer said. The success of the tile works rested on Mercer's pure genius. With a small capital investment, relatively inexpensive operating costs, and an ability to produce a wide range of wares making use of the best biotechnology of the day, the pottery produced unique tiles praised by critics and sought after by architects. The honest handmade quality of the work expressed the ideals of the American art, arts and crafts movement, elevating Mercer to one of the movement's most important proponents. Next. Mercer referred to his new venture as an artistic pottery to master the potter's art and establish a pottery under personal control. Next. Mercer found the local clay suitable to the manufacture of ornamental tiles for which the comparative softness was no objection. Next. Tile Works is a two-story reinfor reinforced concrete vernacular tile factory built in the style of Spanish colonial mission architecture with tiled roof towers and arcaded courtyard. Next. The history and production processes are interpreted on site today with a contemporary view of remembrance. Mercer championed the humanity and dignity of processes and product in the wake of the industrial era. A theme of not forgetting is as relevant today with the age of technology replacing the skill building work. Next, here's a glimpse of the pottery as it looked then and now. Next, the towering chimneys. Next, the saggers, which were boxes that the tiles were put into and fired in the big bottle kilns. You can see some new saggers that we're using today on the right. Next. This is a shot of the Russian stove and the tools of the nation maker hanging on the walls of the Indian house or the studio or big room, we call it. Next another view of the big room. Notice the giant fireplace and tiles everywhere. Katja, Katja. Yeah. Yes. You're, you know, you're off 
uh, you're not synchronized with your slides. Next. Okay, that one disappeared. It's not showing up on yours. Uh, these okay. are the big. This is a large big... high relief yeah. molds. Yeah, you're on. Next. This is the firebox of one of five of the bottle kilns. Next, this virtual tour. Oh boy, that's not right. Right, hold on. Um, anyway, that's a, a tile. I'll come to that next. We can go next. This is a 1903 mascot brick auger that we use today. Still used in production for processing the clay, which we get locally from a lake called Lake Toey. Next. Mm -hmm. And next. This is a slide of the workers at the tile factory. They often were farmers and worked for different seasons, seasons and came back. Next. This is an early slide of the workers once the pottery was revived by the county and tiles were starting to be made again in 1974. <laughs> Next. This is the crew today. Actually, that was them last year on Henry Mercer's birth birthday. And our manifesto is this. We believe that each tile is a simple object of beauty. We believe that the grout that holds them together is our creativity, equanimity, and fairness. We believe the installation becomes the map for humanity, evolving from stories diverse and inclusive to inspire a better personal, local, and global economy. Tiles are better together. Next. Today we are a historic pottery, handcrafting artistic tiles, honestly, that inspire and teacher for, with, and by the people. This is Jesse, who's been there 21 years, pressing the traditional tree tile. Next. Next. We make reissues from hundreds of the over 6,000 historic molds that are safeguarded here. The tiles are sold in the gift shop and largely for the ar architectural and installation market. Next. Oh, okay. The slides are a little mixed up, so I will go to that one, darn. These are samples of tiles that are in the, um, the tiled pavement of the state capitol, which was the largest commission that Mercer had of over 400 mosaics and 16,000 square feet of tile. Mercer chose as his general theme, the history of Pennsylvania and realized his tiles could indeed tell a story. Next. He wanted to preserve the memory of the forest from which the state takes its name, the leaves of the trees and the forms of reptiles, birds and animals that frequently appear. He progresses into the development of Pennsylvania's industry and technology, calling them the symbols of today, all conveyed through clay. And this was his special mosaic technique that he actually patented. Next. Mercer says of his mosaics, if the mosaics are not decorative, they're a failure artistically. If they're only decorative, they go no further than with mere patches of color. But if, as has been contended, they reasonably express within the limits of the craft that produced them, facts and events in the history of Pennsylvania and the life of its inhabitants, 
then the pavement may claim a not unworthy part in the full significance of the Capitol building. Next. Care has been taken in the choice of designs. Influences for Henry included original wall tiles from Spain, mural patterns from colonial America, Italy and the East, floor tiles of the 15th century from England, Germany, France and beyond. Next. His design process was very flexible. It often involved a single image or motif from a specific source, reworked into a number of variations of relief, intaglio, or outline tiles. Making rubbings, wax impressions, plaster mold, Henry Mercer gathered his ideas. Next. His tiles were emblematic of the survival or rebirth of the handcraft tradition. He was recognized as a premier maker of artistic tiles, sought out by leading architects and tastemakers to decorate private and public buildings all across the country. Next, Mercer's pioneering influence was far reaching and still affects tile makers today. Mercer also knew that the narrative was an essential part. Next. Mercer also knew that the narrative was an essential part of his clay work. Quote, if tiles could tell no story, inspire or teach nobody and only serve to produce aesthetic thrills I would have stopped making them long ago. Next. Clay still provides a means for artistic expression, all resulting from the miraculous offerings of the elements, earth, air, water, and fire. Readily molded by human hand, clay takes on any shape until it is permanent, permanently hardened and thus recording human history. This is a quote from Joseph Taylor from the Heil Tile Heritage Foundation. Next. Henry Mercer said, clay moves at the slightest touch. It moves in the sun, in the air, in the fire, till you put the fire out, let it move. Clay lives. Next. Oh, that's not the right side. Okay. Um, that's an example of a tile fireplace that Henry Mercer did of the Wagner fireplace. Next. This is an installation, an important installation at the Jocelyn Museum. Next. And a fireplace, I mean, a um, backsplash. Next. Okay. So we're getting to today. Today we interve interweave the art and the technique of the craft through storytelling. It's become a contemporary expression of shared experiences, creating allegorical and secret ways to explore nature, says Vance Kohler, curator of the Tile Works. We have a legacy series that we've just started honoring artists who were influenced by the Mercer tradition. And our first artist was Gloria Costco with her work seen here. Next. Next. Next, you saved an early version of my talk. Oh dear, okay. Today, this was a um, artist collaboration that we did. Um, we haven't reinstated any internships or apprenticeships, but we're doing collaborations that hopefully have a larger um, meaning and purpose in the world. Next. These are some artists at a wet paint 
event we had and a friend and an artist who's known around the world for his ice sculpture and um, sand sculptures and wood carvings. That's a dragon that he's carving there. Next. Some more events that we have at the Tile Works, some musical quiet um, events in the big room and some big outside parties in the courtyard. Next. Today, a child who's in the Henry Mercer Plus Ultra Club playing with clay and we did some uh, corporate um, team building with Marola tile there. You'll see John Marola right there on the right. Next. This is a picture of Tile Festival 2022. This was our inaugural attempt since uh, taking over the Tile Works in April of 21 as the newest operating um, agreement. We're partnering with the County of Bucks to run the Tile Works and it's a sort of a revival. So the fact that we had Tile Festival this year was our first run and it was very exciting. The morning started off looking like this, very foggy and ominous. Next. Some highlights here of the Tile Festival and we are hoping, hoping um, to have more participants next year and more activities. And this year we did up our game. Um, Cleota Reed, who wrote the book on Henry Mercer and his tiles came. She's seen here on the left with me. And this is a little um, vignette of Marsha Hovland's tiles from Michigan. Next. On the left, we see Vance Kohler and Joseph Taylor at the Tile Heritage booth where they sell tiles that are donated by their members and others that are sold for um, a profit to support some of the archiving work that's going on at the Tile Heritage. We were happy to have Scott Carruthers show up this year and um, you know, he's interested in helping us develop some workforce development things. And we've got exciting conversations starting there. Um, we never set our own tiles before and they're very nuanced um, product to set. So we'd like to eventually um, certify people in making handmade tile and setting handmade tile. So we're beginning conversations now about that. Next. We added some guest artists and demonstrating artists that came um, to the Tile Festival to add to the atmosphere in the new marketplace, which is some booths that we had available in the courtyard. Isaiah Zagar of Philadelphia's Magic Gardens created some of his um, upside down mosaics or sandbox mosaics, and he used some of our tiles in his creation. On the right are the tile geeks who came from all over. One even flew in his, his private airplane to the Doylestown airport, walked to the tile works, set tiles for the day and left. They generously um, donated these tile boxes to tile planters that they were turned loose in our archives and came up with their own designs, were allowed to take whatever they wanted and came up with their own unique designs and set two planters that we will later auction off for fundraising for our museum. Next. On the left is Mark and Beezy of Ardex who has been supporting the Tile Works and helped support Tile Festival for us this year. And on the right was a wonderful activity that I dreamt up for um, kids to set little miniature bricks that we made out of our clay. And that was a big hit. They were actually only using clay slip as the mortar. So the next day we just melted it down, wet it down and started over again. And that was a lot of fun. Next. Joe Taylor is talking on the left to Ricky of Luna Park who is a madcap artist and has built 
uh, a complete artist environment home in northern New Jersey that is worthy of making a trip. And Leslie Godden solving a big 12 piece puzzle, proudly a uh, mosaic tile puzzle of a pine cone. Next. Every day is a great national tile day at the Tile Works. The Bucks County, County of Bucks purchased the Tile Works in 67 and resumed tile making in 1974, opening it, opening it as a museum and a national historic landmark. The county continues to partner with the Tile Works of Bucks County, a newly formed not-for-profit that resumed operations in April of 2021. We steward the historic pottery and make handcrafted artistic tiles that inspire and teach by, with, and for the people. Next. Plus Ultra, more beyond. Thanks to expert excerpts from Vance Kohler, curator and premier Moravian tile scholar and leading expert on American tile, founder of the Tile Heritage Foundation, Joe Taylor. And I will end with a quote from a colleague named Tim Roberts of Materials. He summed up the relevance of this work. He writes, I believe that a true connection to the art and craft elevates our company in an intellectual way and speaks to being an authentic company. We appreciate people like that who understand the importance of the work we're doing and um, its, its connection to the bigger tile world. Thank you all for listening and I hope you enjoyed the slides. Thank you, Katja, that was incredible. Joshua Nordstrom, can I turn it back over to you to wrap up with Katja? Yeah, uh, that was, uh, I don't know if you saw me taking my glasses off and looking in so many times because it was so uh, detailed and so, so much cool information there. I was just ecstatic to see it all. Um, and I'd really like to go to the festival next year. What what month do you shoot for the festival? Uh, when does that usually happen? Um, it's in May, and I think it's May 21st and 22nd, but it's a Saturday and Sunday um, at okay. the end of May in 2023. I think it's May 21st and 22nd. Well, that's going to go on my bucket list, I think, along with many other people in this group. Thank so. you. Great. We look forward to it. I love history, so th this is a this is a fantastic roundtable between the two of you. Um, I don't know if um, if we had any questions come in. I'm just on my phone here, so I, I have a hard time seeing the screen. Um, we don't really have a lot of questions, but we have had a lot of comments about how wonderful the tile works is, and. Um, just what a great experience it is to be there. And uh, I second that and third that. Um, and so there's some, some real enthusiasm here on this chat about uh, making a road trip there next year. So I hope that that's, that's gonna happen. It's very much, very worthwhile. Thank you, Leslie. Looks like it got dark where you're at, Katja. <laughs> oh, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're, we can't see you at all, Katya. I don't know why. Does he know? Well, we can hear your voice. That's all that okay. really matters. Okay. And you see my name. <laughs> <laughs> and your name. One thing I'd like to say is that um, I, I just um, am so thrilled to see so many friends here, people that I know. And uh, it's just, uh, it's a very, very warm feeling to have so many of our friends here uh, for this occasion. And uh, thanks so much, Mark and Leslie and uh, uh, Angie for uh, putting this all together. It's absolutely great. It is great to all be here together. And uh, we're just uh, thrilled to have our artisan team here at NTCA and just such special people uh, like at Tile Works of Bucks County and the Tile Heritage Foundation and others. And uh, you know, stay tuned, we'll have more of these that our artisans put together. And, and we did get a question just now, 
uh, Katya. Does the Bucks County offer tours of the Moravian Tile Works? Um, April says she took a tour there 10 years ago. Is that still happening? Yes, we, we um, have tours Tuesday through Sunday, 10 to four o'clock in the afternoon, every half hour. And we have some special tours too, where people have tour with an experience and they get to make a tile, an um, actual Mercer tile. So Moravian tile. Outstanding. Uh, do you have a website? Is that information available on your website? Yes, it is. It's available at the tileworksofbuckscounty.org. Terrific. Tileworks of Bucks County. Or the tileworks.org. I don't even know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, while you're checking on that Tileworks.org. Tileworks.org. <laughs> tileworks okay. <laughs> Julianne has a terrific question here. Uh, she is curious if any of the speakers know about the role women have played in the making uh, of the tile industry or if the industry uh, its beginnings were particularly male. Does anybody have any background on that? <laughs> oh, well, love that. I, I, no, I mean, I'm, I can answer it. I'll, you know, I will speak about Poabic here. Poabic was started, um, you know, one of the main people in, engaged in the development of Poabic was Mary Chase Perry Stratton. And um, she, you know, was really um, a moving force in both the making and the, the glaze formulas for Poabic. And I know there, I know there are others. You know, someone might want to speak about that. <laughs> Sounds like a good article. Sounds like an article, and it sounds like another roundtable. <laughs> yeah, they're fantastic. We were just out there. Um, Actually, uh, Rookwood as well. Rookwood Pottery with um, yeah. uh, um, Marie Long, what is her name? Longworth Nichols. Saturday Another Evening Girls. Very much um, um, involved in Cincinnati in the Rookwood Pottery's development. Um, so there, there is that. I'm very happy to um, make a cop scan you the article that I was speaking from, you know, and, and had to protract quite a bit because it's long. Um, and Joe Taylor actually wrote this piece um, as a foreword to the Handmade Tile by Frank Giorgini book. But it is a scan and I, you know, can send a PDF to people who would like to just read that history in completion because it's um you know will give more information than I was able to give during my uh, speaking. Um, Look, Sheila, what is your email address uh, that people can ask you, ask you for that article? Foundation at tileheritage.org. Foundation at tileheritage.org. I've just put that address in the chat screen. And I think I had a slide that I didn't put up at the end there. I don't know if anyone can see this, but this is a really an invitation to open a file. Any company, whether they are makers, um, you know, um, or producers in any, of any kind, installers, um, dealers, anyone can have a file in the Tile Heritage Library. And um, we do encourage that. We've, we usually have materials with us um, for this purpose at meetings. We had it at coverings. We will be at TSP, Total Solutions Plus, and we hope to see many friends there. But it's, it's something that we encourage. And that is, if you have um, materials about your company, share them. There's no, no fee for service to open a file in the Tile Heritage you know, archive and library. Okay, great. So again, to get in touch with Sheila, it's foundation at tileheritage.org. And Katja has put up the website in the chat screen there too. It is thetileworks.org. Anybody else have any conversation uh, or questions for Sheila or Katja, our special guests tonight? 
I got one for Sheila. Um, how, you know, if I came to you with, with a, an eight by eight tile, um, you know, it was a pattern tile. How, how do you go about, I mean, you say you've got all these hundreds upon thousands of, of uh, samples. How do you, what's your first step of, of, of tracking down the artist that made that particular tile? Is it, do you look at, is, is, is the glaze, the, the, the type of glaze that's, that, that's usually a, somebody's trademark is their glaze or uh, the stamping they do, or, you know, um, what's, how do you go about that? What's, what are your first, what, what are the couple steps that you go through to, 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 to label it? Most people do send us pictures. They send, and one of the first things that we often ask if they send a picture of a tile, we'll we'll ask a few questions. We'll ask where it's where the installation is, or if it's an installation, if it's an individual tile, then they can usually flip it over. And we want to see the back of that tile. The back of the tile often gives an amazing amount of information. Sometimes there's also stamped with a maker's mark. And um, we do have a, a scholar and historian who has uh, produced a whole catalog of maker's marks for the US and that is um, Michael Padui. So not only do we, um, Joe and myself and other people within the foundation look at you know, what these tiles are and try to identify them either from old catalogs, if they're old tiles, we'll look at the design, we'll look at the glazes, but we have a whole plethora of people yeah, that yeah. are in other countries and here who are historians or, or who are have very specific interests and they can help also identify things. So there are times when we are not able to identify material, but it's amazing how often we are able to actually identify whether it's an installation or an individual tile. And we encourage people to continue to send us things and, and we get it. I mean, probably on a daily basis there, um, one or two people every day who are looking to identify the material that's either installed in their home or something that they've purchased that they are not sure what it is. Great. We'll uh, did, that. did that answer your question, uh, Joshua? That, yes, I did. Okay. Jane. Mark, I, yeah, I, I just let me just chime in for a second here because we are uh, uh, very happy to have been the recipients of some of the great advice from Sheila and Joe. Um, we have uncovered historical tiles in some of our uh, demolitions when we were going to be installing new artisan work. And we've had opportunities where we've been able to say, oh my gosh, stop, look, what is this? And as Sheila just explained, that's how the process worked. We were able to take pictures uh, be care very careful about how we removed or uncovered this tile. And uh, Sheila and Joe are great. You know, they, in this particular case, the last one anyway, they sent us to uh, a historian in Europe and uh, we were able to then talk with him and have a wonderful conversation. And he identified who, when, where, what, you know, the tile was and so it's, it, and how, how important is that, you know, to be able to actually come back to our client and say, here's what you have. And we will try to uh, take this out very carefully. And, and in this case, we actually were able to uh, save quite a bit of these and mount them for them to keep in their home for, for historical purposes. So they're, they're awesome. They're great down there. Joe and Sheila are awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You know, uh, that is a great story. We've been talking uh, so much about history and historical things, and Barbara has a terrific question in the chat screen. Uh, what do any of you see as the future of art tile? Anyone? I, I feel like just a, a quick answer is I feel like uh, there's a resurgence and a renewed interest in the handcrafted thing in this big box world, this highly mechanized cookie cutter world. So I, I think that the art tile and the, the humanity of it and the dignity, dignity of making it is important and will always speak for itself. I think it grows. I think, I think that there is um, a whole sense of um, artistry 
and coming back. And, and I think that there, there's refinement in it as well, as well as having material that is, you know, very much where you're seeing all the, you're seeing the body, you're seeing, you're seeing every aspect of it, you know, you're seeing the, the naked clay. There's also some very refined work that is being done. Um, people who are magnificent modelers and carvers today. And I don't think that they're going to disappear um, while industry you know, continues to make mass produced work. But they work really well with, you, know, you can take a whole uh, installation of um, you know, where that is factory made and add in artistic elements and it enhances everything and elevates everything that happens. And in the, when you see those finished installations, their, their enhancement is because the art is added. And I think that that is a growing um, growing again, it was something that was very prevalent in the 70s and 80s, and even through the 90s. And I think it softened, but I think that the um, artisans are much more in demand again than they have been. I'm here, in, you know, I'm here in Minneapolis, and um, there's a huge resurgence of handmade art tile here in Minneapolis. Um, uh, there's a whole group of people that get together. Um, they have small kilns and whatever, right in uh, no, uh, the uptown area of Minneapolis. I've been to their uh, where they where they have their kilns and and create these and met some of these people. It, it's a uh, it's quite impressive. It's fun to watch, actually. So I see a resurgence in it also. You know, Jim, we had Josh Blank on here for a while, and I I don't see him now. He must have had to sign off, but um, yeah. They're out there. And it's wild, like Matawi tiles, people know them everywhere you go. They, you know, they can pick out a Matawi tile and they're just beautiful, beautiful brand, beautiful product. Well, it's, a, it's a, the responsibility of all of us to um, make sure that we shed this, shed this light on, uh, on, on these things to everyone we meet. Because, you know, a lot of people don't understand that these things aren't dead. All they see is what they see on the shelf. So when it comes to um, art and tile, handmade tiles, uh, we all have a responsibility to educate everyone, everyone we meet on a daily basis. Because, you know, to, to your average person, they may think that that art form is dead. Well, it's far from it, and we need to make sure that they understand that. And if we all do that collectively, um, it can't do anything but um, help it move and grow into the future. Thank you. I would say yeah. that uh, handmade tiles, certainly in, in, like Jim was saying, in Minneapolis and St. Paul area here, the uh, Minneapolis St. Paul Airport took on the airport commission took it upon themselves to hire um, mosaic artists and handmade tile artists. And in the bathrooms, the uh, restrooms, the men's and women's restrooms in the terminal, every bathroom now is being redone with handmade mosaics in it. And it's won national awards and it's great to people just they comment on these bathrooms all the time and i've had the privilege of installing uh two sets of bathrooms at the airport and it's it's amazing people really enjoy seeing all the different types of mosaics and artistry that has come through the airport, I what love airport is that again i'm sorry what airport was that again it's a uh, minneapolis st paul <laughs> Okay. Thank you. And love, I think love flying I, through that airport just for that reason. It's uh, beautiful. I think it's anchors. important. Excuse me, Mark. I think it's important to acknowledge uh, NDCA's um, newest publication, Tile Letter Artisan. Um, 
which is, I don't know, you know, you know that if this, if this uh, uh, woman uh, chooses this subject, it's sure to be an indication of um, something very important that's going on in this country. So Leslie, thank you. Thanks, Joe. It's there's so much beauty and so much inspiration out there being made now the historical tiles. It's I could have 12 issues. Not that I'm volunteering for that, Jim. Um, <laughs> of tile letter artisan, though, because there's so much to cover and there's so much to talk about. And it is anything but dead. It is just flourishing and blossoming. So it's so exciting and it's so beautiful to see. The New York, the New York subway system over the past number of years redid a lot of their stations, completely redid them using an enormous number of tile artists, mosaic artists and tile artists and original stuff. So you can do, you can go online and see some of the, I mean, there are tours of the <laughs> tours of the subway system to see all the yeah, it's, it's a museum in itself for sure. <laughs> Yeah. There is a program that's uh, it's called 1% for the arts and it's uh, any government building that's built uh, from, uh, you know, from a public bathroom to subways to airports or whatever. Um, I guess airports don't fall into government, but they have to spend 1% of their budget on art. And I've got in on that over the past years. And, uh, and it, the small town I live in up here in Alaska, I've, I've got three installations in locally and I've I put in nationally, so you can get on. I, I don't know exactly what the website is, but I'm sure you can Google it, um, and you can get on the registry, and it'll tell you where and when uh, the bids are coming up, and you can put in on them, and it'll tell you if it's local or if, if you can put if an out, somebody out of state can put in on it. But it's great. Um, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of art going on, and um, they've got to spend some of their budget on art. And I wish it was more than one percent. But when you're talking about a multi-million dollar building. 1% is a pretty big number. So um, I don't know if anybody, if anybody else out in, in this group has ever done that before, um, yeah, but it's a, it's a great opportunity. In Albuquerque, we also have that 1% uh, for the arts. And there's been a lot of tile work that's been done by a group called Alma, um, which works with young people and trains them in design and making an installation of mosaics and there's so many of our public buildings are just adorned with these beautiful beautiful oh, uh, mosaics and there's also been a book that was just put out last year called mosaics of central new mexico which is a tour a self-guided tour through all these mosaics through uh this area and you can just kind of do a driving tour and go see it um so it's really amazing i'll have to write something about this for sure because it's something to you know take a road trip, come and see. But um, but yeah, we've been very active in that too. And it's so exciting to see more um, mosaics being done and being done by young people too. You know, I think it's important if I can just say, cause I know we need to get to our next step, but I really, I, I just, am, I think it's so important to acknowledge that the reason we're all even here this evening is because we have decided to collaborate in some way uh, and NTCA uh, paid attention a number of years ago uh, when we were you know, talking a lot about the importance of the historic, history of tile, but we were speaking from a, a tile artisan contractor perspective and NTCA, and thank you, Leslie, and many of you really uh, stuck your neck out and embraced all of that. And I think it's so important that we all work together, you know, and understand that, you know, you need everybody that has with these hands. <laughs> it's the artisan, installer, the uh, maker, uh, the various facets of our industry. And together we will continue to make this a much, uh, we will continue to bring it back. It's, it's history and we need to do that. And so I just wanted to thank NTCA tonight and Leslie for supporting um, our vision and our whole thought about bringing the artisan history back 
to uh, this industry and to the handmakers. Oh my gosh, such an important part. And to everybody that contributes to that. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. And I, I think on that cue, uh, I really uh, do think we should move our conversation along unless anybody has anything else at this point. I, I, we do have one comment from the chat screen I want to bring in. Deirdre pointed out that the Malibu Tile Works was also woman-owned. So uh, it's true. <laughs> I have one last thing to say. So when we talk about artisan and tile letter artisan magazine, Leslie's got a beautiful smile, but when it comes to artisan and, and talking about artisan tile, her smile like beams 100% more and, and uh, you can tell how excited she is about it. And she's really done a great job. We're very proud of her. So um, it means a lot. Thank you for all of you, all of you that are involved. And uh, Leslie, you do a great job. <laughs> yeah, here, here. Thanks, Jim. Uh, okay, we're, you know, we'll have a little time to come back. Let's go ahead and win some prizes and we're going to see who is paying attention a little bit here. So it is time to play our game. This is our game. It's called Ask the Ref based on the NTCA reference manual, but tonight we have uh, questions that were not necessarily in the NTCA reference manual. Uh, when you answer the question correctly, you'll win a prize. And how you play this game is you need to be the first person to place the correct answer to the question uh, in the chat screen. Now we're going to give you some a, a question with some multiple choice answers. And what we need you to do is place the letter of the correct multiple choice answer in the chat screen. And we have a team of artisans on hot standby watching the chat room. And they're going to be the uh, unbiased arbiters of the winners of the questions. Um, and we do have some great prizes coming up um, and we can explain those in a, a, just a couple of minutes. The prize sponsors tonight are Tile Heritage Foundation, Tile Works of Bucks County, Custom Building Products and the National Tile Contractors Association are all providing the prizes for tonight's game. So let's go back to Sheila uh, of the Tile Heritage Foundation for the first quarter. We're playing four quarters, two questions per quarter, and the first quarter goes to Sheila. Sheila? What is the mission of the Tile Heritage Foundation? And Sheila, do you want to read these out for us? We oh, have a winner. Oh, we have a winner. Sell more tile. We have a winner. April. I think we had a winner before the question was even asked. Oh, she read it and she answered. April Halberstadt. April. April. Hey, okay. yes, I'm here. Okay. I'm a fast reader. <laughs> you are. <laughs> yeah. Way to go, April. Okay, April. Um, hey, you can't play this game on an iPad. I'll just let you know. You can't even see the qu answers when you're trying to type in. <laughs> uh, uh, here was the uh, correct answer. April, is that what you got? Yes. Yes. Yeah. C, okay. Um, so, April, uh, you remember that you are the winner for question one. Okay, okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody know uh, at the end of the game how to claim your prize. Okay. So for now, all you have to do is remember the question number. Okay, Sheila, are you ready for question two? I'm ready for, yes, I'm sorry. I was a little behind the eight ball there. <laughs> no, no, you're good. It's all good. Here we go. Question two. What is the primary goal of Tile Heritage? Go. Education. Promoting and protecting all types of ceramics. Hey. <laughs> Provide <laughs> jobs to the tile industry. See how many different tiles it can photograph and document, or keep the organization founders busy. Do, do we have a judges? Yeah. Uh, D. Do we have an answer in the chat? We screen? have a winner, um, okay. Alice Dean. 
Alice. Yay. Alice is our winner, our impartial judge Angie says so. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, it doesn't count if I say out the letter then? No, we have to go in the chat screen. <laughs> um, I, I'll never get there. <laughs> uh, okay, Sheila, thank you. Sheila, do you want to uh, tell us what the uh, prizes for answer uh, questions one and two were? The, the questions, I mean, the <laughs> prizes are a tile that is a reproduction of a Malibu tile, and it was made by Malibu oh, Ceramic Lolo. Works in right. Malibu Canyon. Lolo. And I believe it was the 2012 Tile Heritage Commemorative Tile is the one that we chose. And so there's two of those that will come to the winners. April That's and cool. Alice will receive each yes. one of those tiles, and I'll, I'll tell you how to claim your prize uh, in a couple of minutes. We're going to move on to the second quarter, and Katja, Tile Works of Bucks yes. County, are you ready? Sure. All right, here we go with question number three. What year was the Moravian Pottery and Tile Works founded? 1898? 1912 or 1856. <laughs> Look at Alice. Look at Alice. <laughs> Judges, I'll wait for you. I think Alice was technically first on that I saw on my screen. Alice, I see Alice as being first. Alice, Alice was first. Alice? Alice, you got the you're on the hot button. <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, Katja, is this the correct answer? Is that what she got? Correct. Okay. Are you ready for answer or question number four? Here we go, Katja. What was the name of Henry Mercer's beloved dog? Oh, God. Barney, Dingle, or Rollo? You got LMC. LMC. Hel Helen C. LMC. LMC. Okay. Wait, wait, LMC said B, right? Nope, said C. Oh. Oh, okay. That was the last question. Sorry. Last one. Oh, LMC. Yep. Yep. Okay. LMC is our winner. Yeah. I think you can right. do better on that one. You want to do it again? <laughs> Try in the ball. Okay, Katja, what, what did uh, LMC and Alice win? There you go. Look at that. You were almost they have won it. two reissues of Henry Mercer Tile that we will send out to you in the mail. Fantastic. Terrific. Okay, LMC and Alice, uh, hold on, and I'll let you know how to claim your prize. And now up next. Um, Wait, can I interrupt you for a sec? Go ahead, Leslie. I just want to ask, um, I think that... Um, not everyone's muted and there's a phone conversation going on that's making it a little bit hard to hear. So if you can mute it's, yourself. It's, if you're not it's me, it's me, I'm sorry. I'm out in the backyard and they're playing oh, golf. So okay. I got it. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> thanks, Jim. Okay, thanks, Leslie. Let's go on to uh, question number five. And I think this one is uh, Angie Ray, Unique Mosaics by Angie and the uh, uh, Leslie Godden, will you tell us what uh, the prize winners are going to win for these next two questions? Uh, if only I knew. I think, I think that for these, are they, they the are. coloring books? Yes, they are. They are the coloring books. So it's the Tile Artist Recoloring Books that we produced at the end of last year um, with these wonderful um, tiles that you can color and make, kind of make your own, you know, you kind of share in the artistry of what has been created and then you get to color it the way you want. So good luck. Okay, good luck. Angie, are you ready? Yes. Okay, here we go. Is vinegar a good cleaner for a handmade tile or stone installation? All right, here comes the answers. We'll just let what are our answers? 
Um, A, absolutely, use without diluting for best results. B, no, vinegar is a mild acid. Acids do not degrease and primarily work by attacking the minerals in the grout, not the gout, and many stones, thereby creating damage over time. It can also compromise the sealer. Or C, as long as the vinegar is diluted with water to a 50-50 ratio, vinegar is an appropriate cleaner for handmade tile or stone installation. Is it A, B, or C? A, uh, chat, chat, enter your thing in the chat thing there. B, B. Judges will tell Irene, us. Irene, I think we have Irene. We have a winner. Irene? See? Angie, what's the answer? What is the answer? The answer is B. Oh, it's B. Oh, wait. Then no, wait. That's, it seemed to be B. Wait, hold on. Hold hmm. on. It's actually... Uh, yes, the answer is B. The answer is B. So... Is it, is it Alice again? The answer is B. It, ignore my typo. It's B. It, the answer yes. is B. That's what I'm <laughs> the answer is definitely B. B. Yeah. And I think I think the first person to say it. Um is Mary Carmen. That's what I saw. Mary? Mayor Carmen. How, how do you spell that? Mary Carmen was definitely the first person to say it. Mary Carmen. Mary Carmen. Oh, that's right. okay. Olimon is the last name. O L I M O N. O L I M O N. <laughs> okay, Mary. Uh, artisan team, I apologize. I had a typo on that. It was, it's supposed Actually, to be. You know what? I think Alice is right. It was her first. She said it before the answers were even read. I know, yeah, she did. Yep. Right. It was maybe Alice we again. Have, may, yeah. We may have a couple of coloring books that we could send out to <laughs> right. we'll, we'll call it a time. Me so it threw me off. We have two coloring books left, right, Leslie? Yes, I'm sure we do. <laughs> okay. All okay. right. Well, hopefully, I got this Don't next win. one right. <laughs> All right, Angie. Okay. What type of cleaner is good for cleaning my handmade tile or stone installation for routine cleaning? And here come the answers A, a neutral pH or specialty tile stone cleaner. B, lemon oil, C, bleach diluted with 75% water. Katie is the winner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have Katie. Is this what yes. she got for an answer? Yes. I don't know if mine really counts because I didn't say A or B. I answered it before the, but I'm like you, Jim. I can't see the, the question. So I don't know okay. if that was cheating or not. I, had, I thought it was. I thought it was Seth. You thought oh. it was Seth? No. No, it's Kate. It's Katie. Katie was first. Does Seth ready? have? If if Sorry, Seth, Seth has kids, send it to Seth if he's got kids. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. Okay. But I'll take one. <laughs> it's Katie. It's Katie. It's Katie. Katie won. All right. Katie. Okay, and again, that was for the coloring books. Thank you for Angie uh, Ray for those questions. And coming up next, we have the one and only Joshua Nordstrom, Tierra Tile, Alaska. Joshua, are you there, sir? I'm here. Yes, here sir. Go. Here we go. Hold on. Okay. Last two questions. Get ready. Okay. What is an embossed tile? Hey. A three-dimensional tile with a raised design or pattern that is pressed into the tile. B, a tile, a, a tile, a flat surface pattern, tile that when put together form a larger pattern. Or C, an engraver etched 
with engraver etched lines to create a three-dimensional effect. I wasn't looking, I was trying to read. So did anybody else get to see who was chiming in here? Was it? Okay. We have a winner, yes. All right, looks like, um... well, Michael? all the letters have been selected. So what's the answer? So, we'll figure it out. The boss tile Michael is a three Michael. With a raised design or pattern that is pressed into the tile. So it is A. A. That is an embossed tile. Michael? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Michael. Uh, winner, winner, dinner. <laughs> Michael is the winner. And uh, the prizes uh, for answering questions seven and eight are an NTCA ball cap and coffee cup. Right. So congratulations, Michael. I'll let you know how to get that prize. But let's go on to the last question of the night. You ready, Joshua? I am ready. What is an encaustic tile? And the answers are? The answers are A, handmade glazed pattern tile that fit together makes a unique pattern. B, a handmade tile that in which the pattern or figure on the surface is not the glaze, but of two or more colors of clay or concrete to make a unique pattern. Or C, a three-dimensional tile with a raised design or pattern that is pressed into the tile. Looks like April's the winner. Number two. April, you are good at taking notes. It is number B, letter two. <laughs> <laughs> the pattern or figure on the surface is not the glaze, but of two or more colors of clay or concrete that make a unique pattern. Outstanding. I just want to make sure everybody knows in the new uh, NTCA reference manual, we will have uh, coming up next year, we'll have a whole chapter on encaustic tile and cement tile. Very, very big subject. Terrific. So winners, April, Alice, uh, uh, LMC, Mary, Katie, Michael, and Seth, why don't you email me too? Um, I want, would like all of you to email me with your mailing or your shipping address. And my email address is mark at tile-assn.com. Take a screenshot of that if you need or something. Please include the number of the question you won and email me your shipping address. I will get that out to Sheila, Katya, Leslie, and our NTCA offices, and we will get your winner, winning prizes out to you. Mark at tile-assn.com. Thanks everybody, that was a lot of fun. And uh, I wanna turn it back over to our um, artisan team for any last words uh, to wrap this up and we'll, we'll come in. First of all, let, let's go to uh, uh, Sheila, our presenter tonight, Sheila. What, what do you have for uh, wrapping us up tonight, Sheila? Well, I'm very uh, appreciative of everyone in the audience and um, very appreciative of the Tile Heritage Foundation being invited to participate and enhance everyone's knowledge base about tile history and about the purpose of the Tile Heritage Foundation, which is to preserve and protect American tile history. And each of you are participants in making that um, a continued reality for posterity. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila. Katya? Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess to wrap it up, I'd say that I feel like Tile Heritage is the umbrella um, for the type of work we're doing at the Tile Heritage. Um, I mean, at the Tile Works of Bucks County. Tile Heritage has um, supported us along the way. They support the, the Tile Festival. Um, and by the way, I am a director of the Tile Heritage Foundation. And I don't think without them, I would be where I am today. Um, 41 years of making tiles. I think I get my certification as a tile nut um, 
officially and, sh and should get a crown maybe as well as Sheila. <laughs> but thank you for having us. Um, it was really wonderful to talk about, you know, something that we're very passionate about. <laughs> I'll bring it to the next festival and lend it out. <laughs> wonderful. And on special days. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's go to our uh, artisan leaders tonight, Joshua. Um, I'll, uh, you know, I got to say is um, stay creative and keep sharing the love of tile that uh, we all we all have, and um, we'll keep watching this thing grow. And um, you know, it's exciting. It's an exciting ride to to witness here. Um, this this was a pretty amazing roundtable. Uh, the history was, I think, something that we've all been uh, wondering about, and I think those questions were answered tonight. So, um, I guess I'm going to end with just be be creative. You know? <laughs> great, great words, Angie. Oh, I just want to thank everybody for um, coming to this roundtable, and I hope everybody has a great night and has learned something that they didn't know before this round table. So that's, that's um, why this is all important so that we all keep learning. And the history is definitely important to further our knowledge with Tile. Can I just jump in and congratulate Angie. She is going to be an educator moving forward and uh, I'm very proud of you. Good, good job. Thanks Jim, <laughs> I appreciate it. Well Lee? deserved, Lee. Well, I guess I'd like to thank first. I'd like to thank uh, Sheila and Joe um, and Katja for the amazing uh, tour through history. Um, and uh, let's all just continue to make art in tile prevalent again. And thank you very much. Before I go to Jane, I want to say what Irene posted in the chat room that all tiles are lickable. Jane. Thank you. Pink salt tiles that are very lickable. And they they taste they're tasty. <laughs> <laughs> For those that aren't aware, we do many of these round table, tables. Some of you might not be uh, familiar with them in the past, but we continue to offer these. We've offered many, uh, thanks to NTCA and all of their support and the whole artisan team for, uh, you know, looking at all those things that we uh, can do to make uh, tile artisan history prevalent. Uh, from now and into the future. And uh, so all I can say is the uh, the collaboration and the support and I uh, so much respect for all of you in all of these different aspects of, of making history and taking history forward. Thank you. Thank you. And Leslie Godden, why don't you wrap us up tonight and remind us that this will be, has been recorded, please. Yes, this has been recorded <laughs> and will be available, what, in a couple of weeks on the NTCA YouTube channel? That we're yeah. um, I just am will really great. Will it be on the YouTube oh. channel? Will it be on the YouTube channel? Okay. Yes, it? I think so. Right, Mark? We're pretty sure it will be. <laughs> Where it yeah. usually winds up, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, I am really excited to have Sheila and Katja here tonight and to just share the history and 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 the future with us, you know, it's just been really, really great to learn. It's also been wonderful to have, you know, to be working with this team for, you know, what, like a year now. Um, and it's been just incredible. It's great energy here. And to see everybody, uh, it's really good to see all your faces. Um, some folks that I got to meet at the Tile Fest, uh, it's good to see you uh, here. And then other of you that I've gotten to meet other times. So it's just, I'm really grateful for such a turnout. Um, it's exciting for us putting it together to see there's so much interest. And I want to set a goal that as many of us as we can make it to the Tile Fest next year May 20th to 21st, 
um, in Doylestown. It's a great event. And I just want to mention that, you know, you can take the tours of the um, of the tile works, but Font Hill that Katja talked about, which was Henry Mercer's home, is just like a five minute walk from uh, the tile works. And it's an amazing place. I mean, I got to see cuneiform tablets that he had in his collection, which I had learned about when I was a little girl. And it was like so exciting to see them come to life right there in front of me, kind of interspersed with the tiles that he made and stuff. So, you know, you can see both of those um, and, you know, all the wonderful tile, handmade tile, and um, just, it's a great place to come together in this kind of energy. Um, and as Katja has said, the humanity of, um, of tile making and tile setting. So hope to see you all there in May and thanks for coming tonight. And in the immortal words of Irene de Watville, all tiles are lickable. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everybody. This was awesome. Thank you.